Hello students, in the last video lecture of mine, I was talking about the structure and form uh, of the Iliad and uh, when it comes to talking about the structure and form of epic, you have to talk about Aristotle's poetics and uh, coincidentally you already have it in your syllabus this semester. So you are going to learn about it very soon or probably you are already studying it. So. In, in Aristotle's poetics, what Aristotle basically does is that he is giving a framework, a theory of tragedy and how a tragedy should work and how it is different from epic. Now, the most famous remarks upon the form that have come down to us from the classical age, from the age of antiquity, are definitely to be found in the poetics of Aristotle. Okay, and uh, basically it's a fragmentary work and most of it is about tragedy but in which there are several incidental remarks upon epic and and this is the work where you find these incidental remarks on epics and those remarks are going to help us a lot in understanding homer's the iliad and uh, for aristotle as for the greeks in general homer was the great genius of greek, greek literature so you cannot say that when you are reading Homer, you have nothing to do with Aristotle. You have to refer to Aristotle because Aristotle does that. And uh, Aristotle's tragedy was, according to him, a higher form and uh, definitely higher than epic because uh, tragedy deals with events with greater economy of means and concentration of effect. So it represents something in a concise, precise manner. And that's why it creates a lot of tension and uh, creates drama, which is in fact essential feature of uh, dramatic works. But Aristotle believed that the Homeric epics were of perfect kind. And uh, because of its scale, an epic cannot have a unity of a tragedy. So definitely epic deals with larger events and several characters, right? It's not actually compatible with tragedy. Yet you have to have a certain idea about the unity of plot, unity of time, unity of action when it comes to the structure of an epic. Now you will read this unity of action and plot in poetics. So Homer confines himself as far as possible to the representation of a single action and achieves the greatest degree of unity possible in the epic form. So Homer is not uh, writing a tragedy, right? The Iliad is not an Achilliad or tragedy of Achilles. Don't think in that way. Don't expect that the unity of action that you'd find in a tragedy would also be visible in the Iliad. But despite having a much larger structure, despite having a network-like narrative, the Iliad maintains certain unity of action to, to a great extent, which is definitely remarkable in the context of epic. So, Achilles is definitely a hero, but he is not the hero. He is not the only person around him, everything cent centers. No, that is not the case. So, this is the example that you can give that he is missing from, say, book uh, 2 until uh, book 16. Uh, except briefly he would come in uh, book 9 and book 11. So he's ab completely absent in, in most of the books, in many books actually. So yet Achilles is definitely a very, very important figure. He's a towering personality and several things happen because of Achilles' um, anger, right? But Iliad is not the Achilles. So Iliad relates the whole Trojan War in a in a nutshell, in, in a in a different way. It it is not relating the entire thing, entire Trojan War. It is actually beginning in media res. And uh, this is how Homer does wonders with the plot and uh, action. Because he is not representing the Trojan War from the beginning to the end. He is actually choosing a significant part of it and uh, that part can be easily grasped and is complete in itself. 
So it has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end, but the entire war does not get represented. This you have to keep in mind. Okay, so that's why I told you that be familiar with the story of the Iliad. It's very, very interesting. And uh, if you are familiar, then only you will understand all these uh, lectures that I am giving you. So, these three parts, the beginning, the middle and the end, are coherently linked by a chain of cause and effect. That is to say, one thing leading to another through a probable or necessary chain of consequences. And this is how the Iliad matches the Aristotelian definition of single action. So, first you have to go through what Aristotle means by the single action. And then you come back to this point that how Homer's the Iliad matches that. And uh, basically Homer's Iliad tells a punitive Greek expedition. In the story of punitive Greek expedition, it is an expedition by made by the Greeks. Uh, and this is against the Trojans, the people who are living in Troy. And it's punitive in nature because the Trojans have done something wrong. Right? That's why Agamemnon and his men goes to Troy and tries to kill everyone over there. Now, the story is set in a remote heroic age, which is distinct from and of course superior to the present age. And here we have war and warrior leaders everywhere. This is the norm. And uh, in historical terms, this heroic age is to be identified with the Messenian civilization of the second millennium BC. That is to say, from 1600 BC to 1100 BC. Okay. And Homer's Greeks, which is also known as Argives or Danans or Archaeans, with the Messenians, known from archaeological excavations at Messini and elsewhere. So, these are the historical uh, facts and historical information that you need to think of when it comes to the Iliad. The Messenians were the first Greek speakers to establish a civilization on Greek soil and their ancestors had come from the north uh, in Sursa 2000 BC, completing one of the many prehistoric migrations undertaken over several millennia by Indo-European speaking peoples from probably somewhere to the northwest of the Black Sea. And uh, see, this is Black Sea, this is Turkey, over here, and uh, Ukraine, Romania, uh, this is Greece, this is Istanbul, this is Black Sea. So the Black Sea is the body of water and marginal sea of the Atlantic Ocean. So this is the Atlantic Ocean, and this is the Aegean Sea, uh, which the Greeks cross and come over here. Probably Troy is located over here. So on their arrival, they encountered a non-Indo-European Minoan culture, which they eventually absorbed and completely displaced. The Greek, the Greece they then created seems to have been a coherent miniature empire based on several palace centers, including one at Messini itself. It was a bureaucratic and centralized, it was definitely bureaucratic and centralized, although its orderly surface, no doubt, concealed many divergences, including new dialect groupings. Among its sophisticated features was writing in the syllabic script, now known as Linear B. Among its foreign contacts was the ancient city of Troy, now Hisarlik in Turkey. So Troy is located in Turkey. It is now known as Hisarlik, uh, and which is situated a few miles from the Hells Point and the Aegean Sea. So, in a period of widespread disruption throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, towards the end of the second millennium, the Messenian palace culture, its bureaucracy and its writing was destroyed. So this is happening around 1100 BC. And uh, in the same period, Troy was destroyed too. And uh, it was destroyed more than once. In fact, that's what the different layers uh, which have been excavated suggests. And the layers known to archaeologists as Troy uh, 7a met a violent end in around 1220 BC, which corresponds roughly with the traditional date of the sack of Troy, okay, 1184 BC, which is accepted by the Greeks of the classical period. Now, <clears throat> this was the historical uh, overview of uh, the Trojan War. 
and uh, the main action of the Iliad has to do with the anger of Achilles okay and it is set during the Trojan War 10 year siege of the city of Troy which is known as Ilium okay so that's why Iliad song of Ilium that's why Iliad so 10 years have passed after the Greeks have sieged the city of Troy and uh, it tells of the battles and events during the weeks of a quarrel between King Agamemnon and the warrior Achilles, the supreme warrior Achilles. Although the story covers only a few weeks in the final year of the war, the Iliad mentions or alludes to many of the Greek legends about the siege, the earlier events, such as the gathering of warriors for the siege, the cause of the war and related concerns tend to appear in near the beginning. And then the epic narrative takes up events prophesied for the future, such as Achilles' imminent death, the fall of Troy, all these things do not happen. When you read the Iliad, you will understand these are not happening. The death of Achilles never happens. The fall of Troy never happens in the Iliad. But these things have been prophesied in the narrative. And uh, these events are prefigured and alluded to more and more vividly when it reaches an end. The poem has told a more and less complete tale of the Trojan War. So when we reach the end, we have complete tale of Trojan War. Okay. So primarily, if you see that we have talked about history, the historical uh, aspect of the Iliad in today's lecture, and we have also highlighted the structure of Iliad. Now, in the next lecture, I will talk about the society which gets represented in the Iliad. Okay, so that you understand the themes in a better way. Thanks for watching.